Devil's Throat by Robert Eastland Read by George Sewell On the night it happened, the vault of the highwayman was filled with music, raucous, beery laughter and a fine blue mist of cigarette smoke. In a lonely corner, though, Larry Stern sat bleary-eyed and unshaven. He was a broad, heavy man, with a coarse-grained face, powerful hairy wrists, and hands the size of shovels. Everyone gave him a wide berth. Not just that night, but all nights, in fact. Some were sympathetic, of course. Poor, aging Larry Stern, they'd think. A lost and broken man since his pretty wife, Marilyn, had run off into the night with local ramrod, Tommy McFarlane. And all of that on top of his great personal tragedy Larry had suffered during the Falklands War. Poor, dangerous Larry Stern, too. For one leg or not, he was still a paratrooper at heart. For his own part, Larry had always been philosophical about the stream of golden tracer which had ripped his leg into bloody chunks that lively day on Tumbledown Mountain and had left him a cripple with a run-down Yorkshire cottage, a measly pension and a brave but overworked wife. After all, it was the red badge of courage, wasn't it? People could actually see that he had been where the real action was. Other related matters, though, had gradually got to work on Larry. The fact that he'd never really taken to the artificial limb they'd first given him, and had eventually had to resort to an old-fashioned peg leg, that had been a bit of a problem. Oh, mothers would still stop to point him out to their children and call him Larry the War Hero but the novelty had not lasted that long, and it had never really made up for the fact that he'd not only found himself unemployed, but practically unemployable. That he couldn't drive anymore. That he couldn't get up the terraces at Bradford City. And most important of all, that he couldn't show Marilyn much in bed. The doctors had been pretty unsympathetic about it, too. They just said he was lucky to be alive, after all. He might as well not be now, he reflected slumped in the highwayman vault, drowning his bitterness with yet more strong, dark ale. Larry cursed aloud. The punters at the bar cast nervous glances in his direction and shuffled further away. The landlord at the other side, looking at his former good customer with sad but wary eyes. Nobody wanted to remain in Larry's presence these days. Not any longer than they absolutely had to, anyway. They'd all seen the shocking violence he was capable of, even with his wooden leg. Few of them had forgotten the occasion when Larry had assaulted two drunken Irish navvies in the parking lot outside, simply because he chanced to overhear one say that Sinn Féin would always get his vote, whatever the volunteers got up to. Larry had seen too many of his old army pals murdered and maimed and pumping out blood on the battle-scarred Belfast streets to let such a comment pass. Yet the insane fury with which he had smashed a beer bottle into one's face, kicked the other's head against the wall with skull-splitting impact, and had generally beaten them both in an unstoppable rage until they were both half dead, had seemed a little severe, and had raised some whispered speculation about where Marilyn Stern and her lover had really disappeared to. Larry had survived the incident with the Irishman, He'd been found not guilty of GBH partly because of his obvious physical impediment, partly because of the many braids he'd won during his military service, but mainly because the IRA had blown up a West End pub the day before the jury were due to return their verdict. Everyone he knew had turned out to celebrate with him that night, slapping him on the back and buying him drinks. Even then, though, in the midst of his triumph, as the hours had passed, and his eyes had misted to that old, familiar, feverish red, they'd begun to edge away from him again, even his best friends, just as they were doing now. Not yet, he blurted out, rising unsteadily from the pub bench. Not yet. G Gully got much drunker. Much drunker. Not going yet. With that, he ordered himself a large Jack Daniels. He blundered back to his seat, his head spinning as he downed the hot, spicy fluid. Nothing seemed to make sense to him anymore. And that was fine. That was just what he wanted. He staggered into an upright position again and toppled towards the vault door. This was one grisly thing he was going to have to go through. 
and the drunker he was, the better. Christ, but he didn't want to see their faces again, their green, pulped, rotting faces. He'd do anything rather than this, anything. He had no choice, though. And as he tottered out under the wet, black October sky, the lurid memory of that ghastly night three years ago came flooding back to him. It had been dark and wet that night, too. Larry remembered the chill autumn rain spattering on the windscreen of McFarlane's Land Rover and the muffled cries and wild, vain struggles of the bound, gagged bodies in the back. They told him he wouldn't be able to drive again, those military doctors, but Larry had proved them wrong that night. He'd driven all right. How he'd driven. Slewing that vehicle down the rutted cart track that was Blamire's Lane, grinding the gears, crashing over curbs and ripping through the foliage. It had hardly mattered. McFarlane wouldn't be needing his Land Rover again. That bastard! Larry was going to show him that night. He remembered the smell of crushed grass and churned mud as he skidded the vehicle to a halt on the deserted playing fields which had temporarily become a building site. He remembered climbing from the cab, a pick in one hand, a loaded Colt Cobra 45 in the other. It had been dark as silk down there, silent as the grave. Perfect. And all of that because a half-mile stretch of the Shipley to Harrogate Railway had been under repair. How bloody perfect. He dragged them from the back of the Land Rover, as naked as he'd found them together, and frog-marched them down between the diesels and the lifting engines, through a broken-down piece of mesh fencing and out into the disrupted railway, and then into the Devil's Throat. The Devil's Throat. That too had been perfect. It was a single railway cutting, a narrow canyon sliced through a mountainous slag heap, over a hundred yards long and as black as a colliery tunnel. This was to be the last resting place of Larry's two victims. Mercilessly he'd march them in, forcing them along at gunpoint, McFarlane stumbling and pleading, Marilyn silent and stiff, a thing without hope. It was here where Larry had taken a last look at his wife, her flaxen locks plastered down in the rain, her firm brown body trussed up like a chicken and shivering in the cold. It was here where Larry had executed them both, where he placed the nozzle of his Colt Cobra between their eyes and given them a single slug each. The bodies had then been swiftly buried in the silt and gravel on the floor of the Devil's Throat, and Larry had hobbled back to the Land Rover. He'd not left, though, before he'd first marked the spot by chalking a tiny chalk cross on the ageing brickwork at the side of the cutting. It had amused him, that had. A cross! Ha! A cross! It was more than treacherous scum like that deserved. Still, it had not been put there for their benefit, but for his. It could only be sensible to make sure that he at least knew where the evidence lay. Within the week, the Shipley to Harrogate Railway had been relayed over the unnamed graves, and as far as Larry Stern was concerned, the affair was over. It was not, however. The two murder victims could have lain undisturbed for a hundred years, but apparently they were only going to be allowed to do so for three. They're ripping the bloody thing up again, roared Larry, hobbling painfully down Blamire's Lane. Now, it seemed, the Shipley to Harrogate Railway was to be lifted again and the Devil's Throat to be blasted. The old soldier adjusted the sack over his shoulder. A flashlight, a pick, a shovel and a bundle of old ropes were inside it. You bloody cow, Marilyn, he muttered. Even dead, you're a flaming bloody nuisance. When he finally arrived on the old playing fields, he struck out quickly towards the railway lines. A fine drizzle was falling just as it had been three years ago. But the place was tranquil now and bathed in silvery moonlight, a smooth expanse of cropped turf. As he squelched his way across it, though, Larry knew full well that within a matter of days this quiet place would be a chaos of building materials again, and that was why he had to hurry. The great hump of the slag heap came looming up ahead of him, amorphous and featureless in the dark, and for the first time that night, the old soldier felt a sudden tingle of trepidation. Just for a second he held back, 
regarding the vast muddy shadow it made on the cloudy grey-black sky. Somewhere under there, Marilyn and her lover awaited him. A chill ran along his spine. Sod it, he finally hissed, striking out again. The old mesh fence had never been properly repaired and hung from its cruciform structures in shreds for hundreds of yards along the side of the railway. Larry climbed through, scrambling down a steep pebble bank to the metal rails. It was not exactly easy going for a man with one leg, but he made off towards the cutting nevertheless, slipping and skidding on the damp sleepers, tripping on the ring bolts and swearing volubly. Before him, a veil of impenetrable blackness hung in the deep gorge that was the devil's throat. Even under the intense beam of his heavy-duty torch, the complete darkness seemed to advance to meet him rather than retreat. For a moment, it was a formless but solid object filling the old gully, a reaching, hungry thing. Again, Larry hung back, momentarily stunned at the illusion. Lord of crap! he finally muttered, stumbling on into the canyon. His unkempt hair was already drenched, and rain splashed from his plastic waterproof onto his sodden jeans, gurgling inside the training shoe he wore on his sole surviving ankle. Such discomfort was no problem for Larry Stern, though. He'd spent too many winter nights bivvied up on the Brecon Mountains during training exercises, or laying face down in ditches out in the green-black hell that was Ulster's bandit country to be concerned about things like that. He huddled deeper into his mac, hunched his shoulders forward and pressed ever on into the passage. He feared nothing and nobody, he repeatedly told himself. Nothing and nobody. And suddenly he received a terrible and sobering shock. Where the old Victorian masonry had clung to the deep sides of the railway cutting three years before, Larry's flashlight now showed only roots and crumbling soil. There were some bricks present, of course, but only in piles of rubble on the floor. The cross. The marker. How the hell was he going to find the marker now? Larry stood stock still, aghast, his spine crawling. Involuntarily, he began to shudder violently. All of a sudden, the black rain seemed unbearably cold and fell on him in blinding sheets. In a sudden panic, he began to struggle along the old railway line, plunging deeper into the canyon. Wildly, he scanned the corroding walls with his torch. Everywhere, though, it was the same story. That ancient, greened brickwork had long since collapsed. Larry was far from defeated, though. He came rigidly to attention, determined to consider his options in a clear, organised and efficient manner. There could be no mad blundering through the dark here. There was no time for that. First of all, he had to try and remember how far into the passage he had originally marched Marilyn and her lover. Thinking about it, it couldn't have been a lot further than this. Perhaps his best bet was slowly to work his way backwards, examining every fallen brick if need be. He still had hours before daylight. He looked thoughtfully at the nearest heap of rubble and swept over it with his flashlight. And to his astonishment, he saw the white flicker of what looked like chalk on the topmost rock. Larry started, then bounded forwards, training the light downward. It hardly seemed possible, but there, right in front of him, was a hunk of brick marked with a tiny white cross. He could hardly believe it. Too stunned at his good fortune to even speak, and too overwhelmed with relief, Larry backtracked away into the very middle of the railway line and looked down at the mud below him. This was it. This was the very spot. They were buried right underneath him. And then something else attracted his attention. A shrill whistle in the near distance, then a faint hissing and the distinctive rattle of living metal, the sound of mighty wheels storming along stainless steel tracks. Larry looked sharply up and saw in the blackness far ahead of him a minute blot of light which was rapidly growing larger as it approached. Jesus God, he swore. It had never occurred to him that the line might still be operational. He had never dreamed that trains still passed through this cutting. He turned to fling himself to the side, but was roughly pulled backwards. He was caught on something. In a panic, he shone his torch down, and his eyes almost started from their sockets. Four black arms, 
twisted and mottled like the dead branches of trees and with hideous skeletal claws on the end of them, had pushed up through the mud and damp gravel between the sleepers and were now wrapped around his leg, their steel fingers hooked into the denim. Larry felt the dark and stormy world swimming crazily around him. His tongue filled his throat. His mind spun out of control. Marilyn, he stuttered, you bitch! Then the canyon was filled with light and a thunderous howl shattered his eardrums. Larry looked directly up at the torrent of fire and steel which filled the canyon from wall to wall and tumbled headlong towards him. Most of Larry Stern's body was found in Harrogate. But one singular article quickly led the police back to the scene of the tragedy. It was a stout piece of timber. His broken off wooden leg, in fact. When they actually found it, it was standing upright, jammed between the points in the devil's throat. <laughs>